Kia ora everyone, I'm TJ, welcome to my channel. If you are new around here and you want to become part of a compassionate, caring community who want to raise awareness about cases and seek answers for victims and their families, you are in the right place. So please hit that subscribe button and join us. Please remember to give the video a thumbs up as well. And if you hit the notification bell to all, it means you'll get notified whenever I post something. If you are a returning subscriber, many thanks. I appreciate each and every one of you. Please stick around till the end of the video today as I have a big announcement to make. But at this stage, um, let's have a look at our case today. We're talking about this beautiful young lady up here, Jane Furlong. This video is about one of New Zealand's longest running cold cases and about her death. I've touched on her case before but I've never really got into it and a few members have requested it. So it might be a long one. Grab a cuppa and some snacks guys and let's get into it. Warning, this video has adult things that are not suitable for a younger audience. There will be no victim shaming or blaming on this channel or you will be moved and blocked very, very quickly. So first we're going to police.govt.nz and I've it's sort of gone over this little case before but it just gives an outline of your case so we're going to start here again um everything we go over is going to be in the description box below there'll be links to all the articles so you can actually go and look at them further if you need to right cold case nearly two decades after 17 year old jane furlong went missing from auckland's karanga happy road in 1993 her remains were found at a remote Port Waikato Beach. Jane had been buried in sand dunes some 90 kilometres from the last confirmed sighting of the young mother. The discovery sparked the third investigation into what has become one of this country's most enduring cold cases and we'll have a look at the map a bit closer at the end of this as well. Police believe the young sex worker knew her killer and that he has a link to the small seaside settlement at Sunset Beach, Port Waikato. The last official sighting of Jane was at 8.30pm on the 26th of May 1993, outside Rendell's where she usually worked. There is now strong evidence of a later sighting of Jane the night she went missing, running, scared and entering the Adam and Eve massage parlour 500 metres from where Jane was working towards the Ponsonby end of Karanga Happy Road. And... Um, Definitely over the years we've heard different things about the case, you know, I wanted to just dive into them a bit today. So this is Port Waikato here, so Auckland, Hamilton, um, and if I do it the right way, because you know how much I love getting it wrong. This down here where this heart is, is sort of the Sunset Beach area. If we look at it through the satellite, you can see that um, it's very, very remote. I mean, we're not seeing houses around there for, for a while. So, you know, for someone to even know about this area, um, and then again, they must have some link to it, as the police said. All right, let's move on. Furlong murder cold case. 10th of June 2019 this came out. Police have revealed a new person of interest in a 26-year-old murder mystery that claimed the life of a young Auckland mum. Jane was a part-time sex worker at just 17 when she went missing from Auckland's Karanga Happy Road in May 93. Her son was just six months old. Her partner Danny reported her missing two days after she was last seen. Gotta say that Danny was... Uh, very extensively looked into uh, as a suspect and was cleared from what I am knowing. It would be 19 years before Jane was found, her remains discovered buried in the dunes at Sunset Beach, Port Waikato in May 2012. The next year, police announced a $50,000 reward for anyone who provided information or evidence that would lead to the conviction of Furlong's killer. Despite the catch offer, a major police investigation spanning more than 26 years dubbed Operation Dahlia, an arrest is yet to be made. But police are hoping that Sunday night's episode of Cold Case, which placed a renewed focus on particular people connected to Jane Furlong, including a person of interest, 
will flush out crucial information that could help solve the mystery. Unfortunately, we know that that hasn't happened quite yet. Let's try and flush them at ourselves. Detectives revisited a critical time in Furlong's life in the true crime series on TV and Z1 and hoped new witnesses would come forward or that some who had so far refused to speak to police will finally break their silence and identify people and corroborate alibis for individuals Jane had conflict with that could have had a motive for harming her. At the time of her disappearance, Jane was involved in three not one, not two, but three serious court cases. She was a witness to a vicious assault in K Road, was involved in the trial of an Auckland businessman who was facing charges relating to a string of violent sexual attacks on eight women, most of them prostitutes, um, that was Mr Colley, and was a witness and a complainant in an incident where a crossbow had been fired. And we're going to look more into this incident about the crossbow. Police previously said they did not believe the Collie case was connected to Furlong's death. But last night's episode of Cold Case revealed a person of interest who was associated with the crossbow incident. While they did not name them, the person of interest was described as an associate of Furlong and her partner, Danny. And this uh, is Judith Furlong. Jane's mum and you know imagine going all all these years all these years knowing that some prick has got away with us a group that Danny was with ran a place where they and others would go to drink and smoke drugs and he also sold them drugs Jane's diary indicated she owed him money retired detective inspector Mark Benefield who worked on the case told of another incident where she'd been in debt to the group which resulted in them stealing Danny's car. The couple then confronted the group, Jane armed with a knife, and were met with a crossbow. But police intervened before it turned violent. So none of this is sounding good. Police also revealed the person of interest's family had a batch at Sunset Beach, where Jane's body was found and was the only suspect with a connection to the area. On the night of her disappearance, an employee at a Karanga Happy Road massage parlour saw Jane being pursued into the establishment by two, quote, heavies, who said she owed them money for drugs. The day after her disappearance, the person of interest missed a scheduled court appearance. During the episode, police also revealed potential for new evidence to come forward, including that Jane's favourite leather jacket that she wore the night she disappeared had never been found. Uh, from what I can remember, and I'm hope, don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure she had a brown leather jacket with tassels on it. May have to look that up. Detective Inspector Paul M- Newman, the current head of Operation Dahlia, said some people connected to the person of interest had refused to engage with police. stuff.co.nz Kelly Dennett September 29th 2019 suspect in Jane Furlong cold case murder to be released from prison as a suspect in the 26 year old Jane Furlong cold case murder nears release from prison 
following a parallel investigation in which he was jailed for the rape of her best friend, Kelly Dennett uncovers new details about the police investigation and a pivotal event leading up to Furlong's disappearance. Now, this is a seriously long article, very, very well uh, put together, but I'm not going to read everything, so you might want to come back and do that yourself. So it centers on this young lady called Amanda. She is extremely anxious. She can't eat or sleep. She's hyper alert and disorganized. She's upset because she's missed the final parole hearing for Mr. McGrath, a 53-year-old serving a five-year, four-month prison sentence for her rape. He's about due out and Amanda was supposed to meet members of the parole board uh, where she would make a strong submission against his release. Somehow it didn't happen. Uh, when a complainant wants to make submissions, they do so privately before the actual hearing. So then they can avoid their assailants. That afternoon, the board would travel to Rimutaka Prison to see Mr. McGrath separately. Her dedication to attending parole hearings is almost to a fault. In 1996, Amanda, aged in her early 20s, was kidnapped and raped by a guy called Mr. Taylor. After raping her, Taylor made bail and, while free, murdered a young and pregnant Nicola, Nicola, Nicola Rankin. Taylor is serving a life sentence and every few years Amanda gets herself to his parole hearing and makes submissions. Amanda thinks that the more time McGrath stays behind bars, the more time police will have to keep investigating the murder of her best friend Jane Furlong, of which Mr. McGrath has previously uttered himself as a suspect. If Jane Furlong were alive today, she would have celebrated her 44th birthday this week. Her only son, who she gave birth to months before she went missing, is older than she was when she died. For nearly 20 years she was missing when her remains were found in sand dunes at the remote Sunset Beach at Port Waikato, a rugged surface paradise on the west coast of the Franklin County District in 2012. Nobody has charged or been charged with the murder. The discovery of the remains revitalised the case. A small breakthrough in the murder investigation in 2015 saw McGrath prosecuted for Amanda's rape. The charge was laid after Amanda confided to detectives that McGrath had barricaded her in his bedroom at an Auckland property in the early 1990s where she and Jane and a number of others had gathered. McGrath was found guilty at a jury trial while Operation Dahlia detectives were stationed outside the courtroom. Parts of Jane's own diaries, which verified aspects of Amanda's evidence, were read to the court. Giving evidence in his defence, McGrath said he was a suspect in Jane's disappearance and claimed Amanda had concocted the rape allegation quote, because she can't pin the Jane thing on me, unquote. Police subsequently issued a statement scoffing that if someone wanted to publicly call themselves a suspect, whether imaginary or real, that was their business. Another important witness who knew Jane was nearly killed in an incident that caused him grievous harm. Speaking publicly for the first time, McGrath's brother, who asked not to be identified, said Mr McGrath had spent time at Port Waikato family batch in his formative years. He had told police about the property, but two families who purchased the home since Furlong's remains were found said police had never searched it. Okay, so let's just break this down for a second because it's kind of confusing. But So this Mr McGrath in court said um, she only concocted this story this rape story because she can't pin the Jane thing on me so essentially he's confessing to this Jane thing uh, Jane's murder by the way not a thing um, in court which is bizarre his brother is now speaking up and saying that they had a family batch in the area where her remains were found but the two owners since her remains were being found, said police have not searched that batch. And if that's the truth, then I wonder what the hell the police have been doing if they are not doing their job. Just my opinion. His impression from investigators said that Mr McGrath was the prime suspect in the investigation. 
But given the intervening years since Jane's disappearance and the discovery of her body, we're having difficulty proving his involvement. At one stage, the brother felt suspicion resting upon him because he was close to McGrath at the time. He said, quote, I think they were hoping for a confession from me or something, unquote. This is very interesting. Prior to her disappearance, Jane and her boyfriend had a dispute with McGrath over a car, which ended in a violent melee at a West Auckland factory during which a crossbow was produced to an, or by an associate. The brother witnessed the event and said a crowd of people had gathered at one stage and were attempting to run over Mr McGrath who was drunk and unconscious on the ground. McGrath's associate allegedly produced the crossbow to try and protect him. Police arrived shortly after he said the last time he saw Jane she was pregnant and he said she was happy. So we're hearing more about this incident with the crossbow. Um very very interesting when the parole board report is mailed through to amanda a week after the hearing it confirms thank goodness that mcgrath was not granted parole the day before the hearing mcgrath signed a waiver saying he would not appear at all because he wanted to fully complete his sentence i don't know many criminals that want to serve out their whole sentence just saying he also says that he does not need a kangaroo court to say that he is guilty of something that he has never done, the board noted. Um, okay, so yeah, I don't believe in kangaroo courts either, but, and I also don't believe in names, but he outed himself. He put himself into Jane's case. No one else did. He said it in court. So he's either just a dick and an idiot, or he had something to do with it. McGrath had also no support in the community for his release and indicated he would not comply with special conditions if the board imposed them. Until then, Amanda will keep holding her breath. You know, there's some other interesting stuff um, regarding Amanda and, and her stuff that she's going through. I just didn't think they were relevant to um, Jane's story, but for sure, if you want to go read the article and look at those parts I didn't read go down to the description box quickly before we move on Crime Stoppers is 100% anonymous 0 at 100 triple five triple one you can call police on 105 or you can go online please case notes or sorry case suggestions email me at nzmissing at gmail.com please um, come and see our great facebook community if you can support the channel with a three dollar donation please go to buymeacoffee.com slash nz mysteries and it really helps keep the channel running so i really do appreciate that please like and subscribe and hit the notification bell to all so you get a notification thanks donna who has bought me a coffee lately let's get back into it Okay, police investigate possible new Jane Furlong lead, but experts doubt cold case memories. This is again written by Kelly Dennett from stuff.co.nz, and this was just released on May 23rd, 2021, so not long ago. And this is a pretty interesting story. A man tells police he saw Jane Furlong a day after her disappearance, being escorted through Port Waikato's sand dunes by a group of men carrying a spade. On the anniversary of the unsolved murder, Kelly Dennett examines his story and considers the fallibility of memory. Again, I'm not going to read everything in this article, um, just the things that I think are relevant. For this guy, the scene made him so uncomfortable he says that he documented it. Surreptitiously turning the flash off on his black Olympus camera, told his wife to pose and hit snap. Where that photo is now is anyone's guess, but if it is still exists and captures what he believes he saw, it could hold the key to one of New Zealand's most infamous cold cases. Here's how it happened. One afternoon in 1993, a man who, stuff has chosen not to identify, took an impromptu drive to Port Waikato Sunset Beach, a remote and windslept coastline, about an hour's drive south from Auckland, slightly longer if driving north from Hamilton. The man was then 27, believes it was Thursday, May the 27th. 
based on her starting a new job around this period and the patterns of his shift roster at the time. The night before, teenage sex worker Jane Furlong had disappeared from Auckland's Karanga Happy Road, although that was not yet public knowledge. So I think the big thing there is it was not yet public knowledge uh, for me. And I know when he says he recalls things around starting a new job, um, I actually do too. I started a new job recently and I remember dates when I started and some shit I did around that time. The man says on the rural road out to the beach he was followed closely by a group of men in a blue car. It appeared to be a unique left-hand drive car and he says he could see a young woman sitting amidst them. Closely behind that car was a white car containing two men. The man let them pass but he saw them again as he and his wife arrived at the car park at Sunset Beach. This is when instinct kicked in. Something was wrong he says. He quietly eyed the group, believing the six men were aged about 23 to 33. They were wearing jeans and some had long jackets. They looked like they could be bouncers at a club, he thought. None of them looked happy. But it was the young woman's demeanour that struck the man. She was petite, aged maybe 18 to 28, with auburn-like hair that looked curly, with volume, or maybe just messy. She looked confused, perhaps hungover. At one point he thought he caught a glimpse of her being pushed or maybe she tripped and as she tried to catch her balance she put her hands up to the chest of one of the men who grabbed her by the forearms. The men were serious and unsmiling and the situation seemed tense he said. There was a short conversation between the woman and one man but nothing the witness could hear. He said, I could feel it in my gut it was wrong. I don't think in my whole life I've ever seen a group of people to come to the beach who seemed like they were so unhappy. If this guy's memories aren't real or um, a fake or whatever, uh, there's a lot of detail in them. Continuing, and so he quietly took that picture, thinking that maybe he would need it one day. He took another as the group walked off. He felt powerless to do anything else and considered that maybe he was reading too much into it. As the woman wandered towards the sand dunes with the men, he says he noticed one of them quietly slipping a spade he'd retrieved from the boot close to his body, almost under his jacket, like he didn't want it to be seen. I thought, oh, that's weird, but not that weird, the man says. People do take a spade to the beach from time to time, but usually they're dressed like fishermen. The man and his wife spent a short time on the beach, leaving shortly afterwards, he says, as he was late for work, he thinks it was about 1pm. The woman he'd seen had not been assaulted. She hadn't called for help, but something nagged and he thinks it was that Saturday he killed the... It was that Saturday that he called the Hamilton Police Station, explaining what he'd seen, explaining about the photographs. So this is the first time he calls the police and makes contact with them about these photos. He calls the Hamilton Police. The man says an officer told him Pukekohe Police Station looked after Port Waikato. The man says he called them too. Again, he explained about the spade, about the photos. By this time he'd learned a young Auckland woman was missing. So this is the second time he's gone to the police. He uh, rung Pukekohe uh, and what did I just say? Hamilton. He called Hamilton and they told him that Pukekohe would take care of that. As time went on, he assumed police had discounted his sighting, but he continued to revisit it. He thinks he contacted police again, either in 93 or 94. By this time, two photos had been developed, but the man doesn't think he ever sat them side by side with a photo of Jane. This was pre-internet times, he said. So he thinks he contacted the police again. So this will be the third time that he's contacted police with photos, maybe, of the people that hurt her. Life went on. The man left Hamilton and lived overseas. He stored belongings with his parents and separated from his wife. The disappearance of John remained a mis uh, Jane remained a mystery. Come 2003, the man says he was sorting through belongings when he came across the photos and decided to take another shot. 
he says he described the photos to another police call taker, but again, never heard back. So is this the fourth time? I mean, kudos to this guy. He thinks he's got information or evidence that is going to be really relevant to this case, and the police are just not taking it. I don't know what they're doing, but it's not what they're supposed to do. By the time Furlong's skeleton was found at Port Waikato Dunes in 2012, the man was certain he had seen Jane Furlong. In 2021, seeing the publicity about the Red Fox Tavern murder case, in which two men were convicted of the murder of the publican more than 30 years after the victim was gunned down, the man was spurred on again. He said, I woke up one night in the early hours of the morning and was awake for a while and had this clear recollection of what he'd seen. I thought they're obviously still prepared to prosecute an old case if they, you know, did the, the Red Fox Tavern case. He fruitlessly rang the police's dedicated cold case number. It wasn't until he contacted Stuff and was put in touch with detectives that police inquiries began into whether the photographs still exist. So is that five times that he contacted the police? A box of his pictures were dropped off at a South Island police station then couriered to the investigation team. Police found no photos of interest but other boxes are to be searched. And you know, <laughs> I agree that um, those photos could be anywhere. I have boxes and boxes of photos. Um, it's not like we stored them all online or on our phones back then. They were printed and you had to actually... Um, you know store them and then when you moved house or moved overseas or whatever you had to try and take all these boxes with you and things got lost um and misplaced absolutely like i said i'm not going to read all of this a lot of the information on here is experts talking about whether cold case memories are correct and whether his memories are correct or not and if you want to go back and look at that you're welcome to the officer in charge of the case detective inspector paul Mew Newman wouldn't discuss specifically how police had followed up on the information but confirmed the man's account was being assessed quote to see if any further action is required so so I've just given you a whole lot of information and I know that it might be quite hard to take it all in but I wanted to try and give it to you in a good time and good amount of time and give you the most relevant information uh, if you want to go back obviously description boxes everything you need to know it sounds like the police failed if this guy truly remembered that stuff at the sand dunes and why the hell would he make it up and it was so detailed if he truly seen that and he contacted the police five times before someone would take notice of him then that's absolutely disgusting. And again, we see, again, we see in New Zealand that one type of person gets heaps of community support, heaps of police attention and focus, and then other people do not. And um, that's really sad. So let me know in the uh, comments what you think, anyway, about what we've read today. Big announcement, a couple of big announcements. First, uh, there is a king of YouTube true crime called John Lawden, who has been my idol for a long time and why I got into this caper. And he has kindly agreed to come on my show next week and do a recording of some questions and answers. And I'm extremely excited because he's like a celebrity to me. <laughs> so that's awesome. Um, I haven't seen him do interviews or chat you know questions and answers before so if you have any questions you would like me to ask stick them in the comments below and I'll try and see what I can do also luckily for me I'm getting some help from a wonderful lady called Ange and she is working on the website for me and updating it I'd like to I started with a bit of a database and um, I just lost time she also has her own Facebook page which I will link in the description below she is a medium and 
me and her are sort of talking about maybe doing something together maybe um, some sort of podcast uh, in the near future so that will be interesting look out for that thank you for being with me again today uh, be safe be kind to one another and I will see you on the next one bye guys